In 2019, I was as ready to retire as a person can be. I had lived in New York my entire life, and I can tell you, I did not have another New York winter in me. <laughs> my husband Peter and I, <clears throat> excuse me, my husband Peter and I put together a list of what we consider to be essential for our retirement destination. And that list boiled down to three things. <clears throat> no pollen wasn't one of them. <laughs> Our three things. <clears throat> no snow or ice. I grew up on Long Island, and I desperately needed to get back to the ocean. And most importantly, we both knew we would need a UU congregation in our retirement. One of our daughters was living in Wilmington, and we visited a few times and stayed at the beach. We went exploring and visited this congregation once during the week and on a couple of Sundays. We connected with Reverend Cheryl's preaching, and it felt on a gut level like we could make our spiritual home here. It didn't hurt that one Sunday when we visited, Tina Shank reintroduced herself to me. <clears throat> and reminded me that we had been in a dance weekend together in Lake George, New York. So it wasn't just that I felt like my people were here. It was clear that my people were here. And this was a good thing. It didn't take us long to decide that Wilmington was the place. <clears throat> My only anxiety about retiring and moving here was leaving behind the community I had built in Albany, New York over the previous 35 years. I had friends from every part of my life, from everything I had ever done and every place I had ever been. I had friends from college and grad school, elementary, middle, and high school. I had a book group. I had a contra dance community. I had a recovery community. I had friends at work, and I had UU friends. I had friends with whom I would go consignment shopping, and friends with whom I would go to the movies. My anxiety came from the understanding that I would be moving away from all of that support and all of those daily social ties. Retiring here meant that but for my husband, I was giving up my entire support network. No small thing if you think about it. My educated guess, based on knowing many of you, is that you made a similar leap when you moved here. Last week in her sermon, Reverend Kelly showed us this graphic. It's a pyramid detailing Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The part about the pyramid that always strikes me is that as soon as our basic physical needs are met, food, clothing, shelter, safety, we go looking for other people. As soon as our bellies are full, we go looking for love, connection, and belonging. I want to make a distinction between the feeling of loneliness and being socially isolated. The two are not the same. If you are completely content alone on a beach at sunrise, you are socially isolated, but not lonely. If you are standing in the crowd in Times Square on New Year's Eve, you are not socially isolated. But if you have no one to kiss at midnight when the ball drops, you may well feel acutely lonely. Loneliness is the feeling that happens when the connections we want in our lives are greater than the connections we have. Social isolation is objective. It's a measure of how many contacts someone has with other people. Being alone doesn't necessarily mean you're lonely, and being around people doesn't mean you're not lonely. I've always loved the Marilyn French quote in the women's room 
that loneliness is not a longing for company, it's a longing for kind. We don't just want people around, we want people around who get us, accept us, and care about us. In 2023, a Surgeon General's advisory raised alarm about what the report refers to as the devastating impact of the epidemic of loneliness, isolation, and lack of connection in our country. According to the report, loneliness occurs more in people who live alone, those who are single parents, and in people who are older. Loneliness can worsen as a result of trauma, illness, and the effects of aging. The report details physical health consequences of poor or insufficient connections. These include an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. And if you're an older adult, a 50% increase in the risk of developing dementia. Studies show that people without sufficient social support have lower chances of making a full recovery after a serious illness. <clears throat> Lacking social connection is so unhealthy for us that it increases the risk of premature death from all causes by more than 60%, which is about the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And while fewer than 15% of Americans smoke cigarettes, around 60% of American adults reported feeling loneliness in some degree. And that was before the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID lockdowns and distancing made loneliness worse. More people were lonely, and the ones who were lonely before the pandemic were even more lonely once we were forced to isolate from each other. In addition to the effects on our physical health, the Surgeon General's advisory reports that loneliness and isolation contribute substantially to mental health challenges, including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and self-harm. Loneliness and social isolation in childhood increases the risk of depression and anxiety, both immediately and well into the child's future. In adults, the risk of developing depression among people who report feeling lonely is more than double that for people who report seldom or never feeling lonely. So what's the remedy? The remedy for both loneliness and social isolation is social connection. Studies consistently show that social connection is beneficial for people's physical and mental health. Increased connection can help reduce the risk of all of the serious health conditions I mentioned before, including heart disease, stroke, and depression. While many of us moved here not knowing a soul, it's my best guess that the people in this congregation are less lonely than the people in the larger world. I think that's because if social connection is the solution to loneliness, we have that here. Within these walls, there are almost limitless opportunities to make connections. Do you like the idea of having coffee with a friend? We have coffee together down the hall after every Sunday service. Churches, synagogues, and community centers all over the country have Romeo's groups, and we have one too. And for those of you who don't know, Romeo's means retired older men eating out. <laughs> Shortly after I moved here in July 2019, I was talking with a group of women in Dobkin Hall, and I remember saying, okay, there's a Romeo's group. Is there a Juliet's group? And there wasn't, so we made one. Juliet's, by the way, means just Unitarian Universalist ladies interested in eating together. Both the Romeos and the Juliet's meet every month, and we would love it if you would join us for lunch. 
Are you a lifelong learner or someone who loves a good discussion? You can join the Quest community. They meet almost every Sunday before the service. Do you have a song in your heart? Join the choir. We rehearse every Wednesday night from September through June. You don't have to know how to read music. And I can tell you, it feels really good to sing together. We have monthly open house gatherings. There's one today. They're hosted by members and friends of this congregation. They're scheduled for the second Sunday of each month at 4 p.m. Bring a dish or a beverage to share and join the party. You really are invited. Open houses are a great way for newcomers and members old and new to meet and get to know each other. We have a poetry club, a book group, a quilters group. And every Friday there's mahjong. People are really generous with their time and knowledge and will happily teach you how to play. And if you aren't retired yet, you can join the NERDS. That's the acronym for the Not Yet Retired Division. They have game nights, potlucks, and camping trips. If none of these things call to you, and you'd prefer to play Canasta, or Dungeons and Dragons, or Ultimate Frisbee, the membership engagement team will help you get your group up and running. All of these groups are focused on the fun we have together. There are also opportunities to make your, your connections to the people of this community and the community itself deeper and richer. Join a chalice circle the next time groups form. Some communities call them small group ministries. These are groups of adults that meet monthly for a number of weeks. The format of the meetings helps participants reflect on their lives, make meaningful connections with each other. Each month, all of the groups discuss the same topic. For example, living with challenges, gratitude, or balance. And because all the groups focus on the same topic at the same time, the theme weaves its way into the life of the congregation and into our ongoing congregational conversation. If you want to go deeper still, do the final wishes workshop and talk to people as your thoughts evolve on the subject of death and dying. We also care for each other here. If you need to go to an appointment and cannot drive yourself, someone will take you. If you or a loved one have surgery or an illness and are not up to cooking, we will bring you meals. We will visit you in the hospital and in rehab and at your assisted living residence. We have raised caring for each other to an art. We have made caring for each other something holy. And our caring does not stop at our own walls. Our members protect nests of turtle eggs and make sure the hatchlings find their way to the sea. Our social justice ministry carries our values out into the larger world. Members of this congregation travel to Raleigh to speak truth to power. We work to get out the vote, to remove plastic from the ocean and garbage from our beaches. We work to make sure that every child in North Carolina receives the sound basic education guaranteed by the state constitution. And every year, thousands of your dollars benefit worthy community organizations identified and verified by the Share the Plate team. I've actually been thinking about this sermon for a long time. It was born partially in response to a member who used to say that we aren't a religion, we're a social club. And I suppose if you don't work on any of the moving parts necessary to make a Sunday morning worship happen, and if you're not involved in taking care of people, 
or in any of the activities that de develop and deepen the connections between us, and you overlook our social justice work and the organizations that benefit from our generosity when we share the plate, then you could think of this place as just a social club. And while I disagree with that characterization, because we are so much more than that, I have to tell you that if all we did was make connections, enjoy each other, and take care of each other, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> if all we did was encourage and support each other, it would be enough for me, enough to keep me in this community, and enough to keep me in this religion. May it be so. Please.